So um, this talk is a bit of a retrospective. Um, usually, we're used to hearing postmortems around failure. This is more of a postmortem around success. So at least in our opinion, we think we've been very successful with our migration to Kubernetes. And so um, I won't get too technical around Kubernetes because the objective of my talk was that anyone in this room, regardless of whatever tooling that you're using, you have takeaways that you can use and apply to whatever you use. So um, the idea to move to Kubernetes uh, was made around two years ago, two to three years ago, I don't, late, late 2016. And so uh, this, what I'm about to talk to you about is the principles and the ideas that kind of guided us along the way. And I uncovered this uh, trying to figure out what, what are the things that we did that made us successful. So I'm not a one-man team. I work with a bunch of four great people. Um, I'm the product owner, which pretty much means a glorified task manager. Um, but at the end of the day, we are, we are in the trenches together. And there's Zach, there's Hadrian, and me. And we have a unique member called Hattie. He's not here. Uh, he's the head of insecurity. His job is is to worry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, the unique thing about Hattie is that he doesn't he doesn't only protect our digital assets. He protects our laptops. He, intol ins he installs spyware. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Um, and he also physically protects our office. He installs all the cameras and all, all the automated systems. An interesting thing happened last week. We got some email alerts from the um, security system, and there were three guys trying to break into our, into our office, which is quite cool. <laughs> 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 they weren't successful. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit about what we do. In a nutshell, we are a marketing research insights company. We don't really collect the data, nor do we um, sell the data. We, our job is just to automate the process. We work with marketing researchers to get the PowerPoint presentations, Excels, sheets that they want. We are not Cambridge Analytica, so we <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, but uh, as a team, our job is really to take care of the infrastructure, the security now that we have Hattie, who's part of the team. Um, make sure we have up uptime um, and just keep the, po the company in a position where we can deliver the business value that we promise our clients. And so we use all the fancy new tools right now, Docker, Terraform, Kubernetes, Jenkins, and AWS. And so, I mean, just to take you back, this journey started in 2015, where we had the idea that we had to rethink our infrastructure. In about six months of me getting hired, we were discussing potentially hiring 70 more developers. And so, if we look at our infrastructure, we were running Chef at the time, and this is where Adrian joined the team. He joined in with a lot of experience on Chef. But I remember the moment he looked at our chef repo, he was like, this is not chef. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what this is. But, but you see, we were a startup trying to grow. You kind of make do with what you have. You don't have dedicated DevOps. So you kind of have spaghetti code. Um, and the people who are responsible for our chef code weren't really chef experts. It was just like whoever feels like doing the job. And so we had to really rethink how our future DevOps would be because it was starting to become a blocker. One really big problem was that we almost always ran at capacity because if we ever shut down a server, it would take two hours to start up. Um, 
And so when we looked at the landscape, Docker was kind of new. I don't know if, it, if Docker had hit 1.0. Kubernetes was at 1.4. Um, it was really rough around the edges. Permissions, RBAC wasn't really uh, stable. And, and so a lot of things as we came to learn would change going forward. But we were generally optimistic about the tools that were being made available, they felt like they are the future. And so we, we really put our bets, our bets on them. And so before we started anything, we had to ask ourselves, what are the long-term objectives of what we want to achieve? We wanted immutability because we wanted to get rid of the current state of affairs where if we destroyed a server, it would I mean, there was too much state on the server, so we couldn't really throw away anything as we wish. Um, we also recognized that immutability was crucial for scalability at the end of the day. Um, we wanted extensibility. We had issues with developers requesting for new services, and we were like, we can't run that. Um, we couldn't really build upon what we had in a very flexible way. So uh, this was really a problem we needed to address. We needed reviewability. I didn't have a better word for that, so I made it up. But the, <laughs> the idea is we had too many Snowflake servers. Um, there are servers up till now. We can't really turn off because we don't know how <laughs> they were brought up. But <laughs> I mean, and, and you see, it's, it's, a, it's a factor of not having your configuration as code. So reviewability is like uh, a made up word for our dream to kind of have our configuration as code. Observability, we wanted, we knew logging and metrics are really key in whatever future system that we build. I mean, we we were struggling with a couple of servers and we were talking about wanting to scale. If we didn't have metrics and logging, this was going to be a problem. And obviously scalability for obvious reasons. Um, and so just to, we obviously jumped on the Docker train because we felt fundamentally that it, it solved a bunch of problems that we had. As I mentioned earlier, we had a server provisioning problem. If we were to bring up a new server, it would take two hours to, to kind of boot up. And by the way, it wasn't a faultless process. It would fail at like one hour, 30 minutes, and then you run, you run it again. We had a packaging problem. We were running Ruby 1.9.3, not because we really wanted to, because all apps on the box shared the same Ruby. We weren't really using Ruby version management um, packages, so we couldn't really run this app as this version and another app as another version very easily. It was possible, but as I mentioned, the whole chef thing was, it was a nightmare. Um, and we had a process isolation system. So the, we do a lot of number crunching and some of our processes could idle at 500 MB. And when they are crunching, crunching um, the data, they would spike to like 30 GB, right? So this is a, a problem if all your servers are on, uh, all your applications are on one server. So we, we wanted something that would help us kind of handle the process isolation system. And this is pretty much what uh, Docker is. Um, so, as I mentioned before, I don't think Docker had hit 1.0, but our approach was to accept the guaranteed risks. At some point, you kind of have to bet on the, uh, on the right horse. So we felt in many ways that Docker was the right horse. We committed to um, setting up any new services in Docker. I remember the first service that we set up in Docker was actually elastic such, which in hindsight, everyone really, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of advice 
around not running stateful stuff on Docker. But anyway. <laughs> um, and to be honest, we really didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. I did not know Docker at the time. But here we were committing to running Elasticsearch on Docker. Um, but just to fast, fast forward, the impact that using Docker gave us is that we were able to upgrade our dependencies in isolation. We could move an app on Docker and just update the Ruby for just that app. And then we would do this piecewise. Um, we, would have, we, we now had repeatable builds, tests, and production environments. The reason I scratched out development, because and this might be controversial, but I don't really root for Docker for local development, at least for our case. We tried it. It didn't quite work, because our applications are very sensitive to uh, speed, speed um, issues. And so, especially since most of the developers use Macs, Docker natively runs on Linux. And on Mac, there's this translation layer between Mac, the Mac file system and the Linux file system. And these are very big performance impact on our applications. And also, our applications tend to be very complicated. Um, it just became a nightmare. So we scratched Docker for local development, but it has worked quite well for us for our build, test, and production environments. Because of Docker's ability to limit um, resource usage per container, we are able to, to limit resources per application based on the requirements as we observe the profile. And, and the biggest benefit is that we can spin up new servers in roughly three minutes because we don't put anything on the, on the host other than Docker. So it just spins up. And we don't really have to bake like AMIs and all that stuff. We just use like default, the, the default images that come on AWS. And the only thing we install is Docker and maybe um, an agent that allows us to apply 2FA via SSH. And so after, we quickly realized also that Docker doesn't solve the, Docker solved the packaging problem, but not the orchestration problem. So our applications were on Docker. At the time, we were using ECS. Um, and ECS was a new service. It didn't quite solve all our needs. And every time we used to come for DevOps days and we, we share our problems, people would say, well, Kubernetes does this. <laughs> so we were like, okay, screw it. Let's just take Kubernetes. Everyone complains that it's complex, but we feel it's the right solution. We also had a, that's why I was saying we had a serious peer pressure problem. <laughs> um, and we also had a hard, we had a problem with hard problems. So the thing about Kubernetes is like you have all this bunch of really smart people from Red Hat and, um, and Google and Microsoft who are solving the hard problems. In one of the new releases of Kubernetes, I saw that you can kind of, it can do the, um, what's it called? It can resize your volume based on the parameter that you set in YAML. I mean, that's really powerful. Before, whenever I needed to resize our EBS um, volume, it would, I'd have to run all these commands and all that. But I mean, it, it doesn't take away from your ability to do them. I just don't think you should spend the time to doing these things if the tool can do it them for you. And so once again, we knew it's going to be complicated because everyone was complaining about it but we accepted the guaranteed complexity that Kubernetes would, would bring. And it was an opportunity cost thing. So we knew that the benefits of Kubernetes outweigh the friction that it would give us in the beginning. And once again, we still committed to migrating existing services to the new infrastructure one by one. We, we only ran Elasticsearch on Docker on ECS and a bunch of other smaller services related to DevOps. But I think here we were jumping into the pool with both feet 
because we were now committing to running our actual applications that are client facing on Kubernetes. And we also decided to rebuild each tool, each tool step by step. So for example, in the old system, we would SSH into boxes. In the new system, we had to rethink how people access consoles because there's, there's no SSH anymore. We don't give developers keys. There's kubectl. Should we give developers kubectl and stuff like that? Um, and I'll, s I'll speak more about our tooling later. But in a nutshell, our, our impact, the, the impact Kubernetes had to us is that we do not regret our de decision one bit. We feel that fundamentally we have an API into hard problems that Kubernetes solve, solves. Um, and we spend more time in developer enablement than infrastructure problems. And I mean, this is a tremendous benefit that my team and I get to sleep better. There are times we wake up and the thing has scaled, downscaled, self-healed. And this is, this is really nice. But as nice as Kubernetes is, it didn't really solve our internal problems because Kubernetes abstracts infrastructure problems. It doesn't really give us a solution for our internal workflow. And so we decided to add another abstraction called port control. And this is the tooling that I was talking about earlier. We had an internal workflow, workflow problem. A simple example is that a deployment on our terms, by our definition, doesn't quite match what Kubernetes refers as a, def as a deployment. So if we want to run a Rails app, we have um, the app component, the workers, the scheduler. But in Kubernetes, we kind of have to run a deployment for each, each component. But in our internal tool, what we call a deployment is all the, all the components combined that are required to run the app. So a developer would pretty much go port control, deploy the reports app. And in the background in Kubernetes, it's actually creating like five deployments. We had a retrofitting system. We felt that it was worth investing in port control because at some point, off-the-shelf off the tools fail at least from a from work internal workflow point of view. You could take Spinnaker, you could take all the fancy stuff that other companies build, but the thing is they build it for them and not really for you. And so at some point you'll have to beg them to add a feature and stuff like, or you build it yourself. So we felt it was worth investing in port control to kind of build a tool that just does what we want it to do. And the first version of port control could just do one thing, but it was fine. Over time, we added more stuff. And we really just wanted to have one, one ring to rule them all. So, <laughs> yeah. And the impact for us is that we don't wait for, we don't use hacks to work how we, to want to work how we work. We have an API into our internal workflows. Um, port control also exposes an API that's a REST endpoint. A developer can pretty much write a Python script that creates a backup of an app and, and creates also a restore for an app. Um, and developers can onboard in less than five minutes and become productive. So from April 2016, which is when we shipped the the, the port control for the first time, it has handled 50,000 deployments, um, 3,900 in the last month. And so in, in retrospect, as I was saying, this is a, a, a review of what we did right for the past two to three years. And it, it kind of comes off as a narrative fallacy because y you can get the impression that we were very intentional with this, with, with um, getting to where we've gotten to. But the reality is that 
it's very easy to tell this story in hindsight. Um, and that for most of the time, we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm hoping like now as I share the principles that you can have a takeout on what you find interesting. So the first principle is that we do everything in our power to reduce cognitive load on developers. We believe that as much as developers should be involved in infrastructure, they are there to focus on the product. And there are those developers who are able to kind of split their attention between the product and in the personal interest in infrastructure, but most of them just want to get their work done. And if we were to give them the, the right tools, they would be more productive. And so the first thing we do is to halt the proliferation of tools. I mean, this is a, a view of the tools that CNCF provides. This for us is overwhelming, and this just covers the DevOps tools. And um, I'm not 100% sure, but it's probable that we don't even have client-side client tools on this board. So uh, the desire to have one, one ring to rule them all is just so that we can reduce the cognitive load on developers. If we can have one tool that does the job well, it's not that you don't need a tool for watching logs, you don't need a tool for deploy a separate tool for deployments, cutting a release, redeploying your applications, and so on. Um, and so the main drive here is to keep the main thing the main thing. We want deployments to be robust and atomic. If deployments are robust, people will deploy more. If they're atomic, they'll have confidence in deploying. And atomic, atomic deployments mean that when someone deploys, it doesn't uh, turn into a production issue. The deployment will fail before the rollout if it's a deployment issue, but it won't turn a, deployment, a failed deployment into a production issue. We also want to optimize the pushing of code to production because at the end of the day, that's what, that's what that kind of is the unit of work for our clients. And we want to simplify processes so that people can kind of help themselves out. If people can help themselves out, it means less work for us. And I mean, at the end of the day, since we are, we are all into DevOps, the system has to be stable and performant. But um, it's worth guarding against that there is a cost to abstractions when developers no longer care about how systems work, it can cause subtle bugs. But we think it's still a wise position to take that knowledge of Kubernetes itself is not, should not be an operational requirement for a developer. And the realities are that not all developers care about infrastructure. Some people just want to code. Not all developers can care I mean, context switching is expensive for some people. Um, but we, we stick to this because we believe the right, the right amount of abstractions can be very powerful. So an, a, an example of the right, um, the right abstractions is how we apply labels. So for example, our tool is called port control. So you would go, if you want logs, you'd go and say port control logs dash F app equals reports, environment equals sandbox. And the labels that you apply on the CLI are the same labels that you would apply on Kibana if you wanted to get the logs of a certain app for an environment. So on Kibana, you'd use the same app equals reports, app and environment equals sandbox. And if you wanted to get metrics, you'd also go to Grafana and then say, give me the metrics for app equals reports environment equals sandbox. A developer doesn't really need to know how these things were implemented. They just need to rely on the consistency of the tools and how everything is set up. The second thing we do is we try get out of the way as much as possible. 
because we believe the people we hire are smart people who can get the job done. And so we automate as much as we can. So um, just to give you an, some context, in Zappi we have 85 developers. There are four environments, sandbox, staging, UAT, and production. Um, the sandbox environment, oddly enough, is the biggest environment because we have the concept of team sandboxes. So if we, we have about 27 microservices, and, and different teams work on different microservices. So you can imagine 87 developers working on 27 apps on Sandbox. So we introduced the concept of teen sandboxes. So Sandbox is kind of sandboxed even further. So you deploy an app into a team on Sandbox, and your team Sandbox has a grouping of apps that are kind of wired together. So an example of automation is developers need to keep the teams, the apps in their individual teams, up to date. But this becomes a very manual process. If they remember, they would do it once a month. And so we kind of watched what developers were doing, and we created a tool that allows them to kind of refresh their team. So you'd go and say, put control, redeploy team, Super team, exclude, <coughs> app one, and app two, refresh. So refresh means deploy, redeploy every app in the team, redeploy the master branch of each app. And with the empowerment, they would do it like multiple times a week because there are many teams. But we went a step further where we put control kind of auto deploys teams based on watching master on GitHub. Because if you think about it, a team has 14, let's say 14 apps, but at any one point in time, they're working on two apps that concern them. So the rest of the apps that are not tracking, that they're, they're not working on feature branches can become stale. So we implemented automatic deploys that were, if if port control sees that master is deployed in your, the master branch is deployed in a certain app in your team, it would automatically track master for you. And the apps which are off master, it would exclude from the auto, re auto redeploy. The second way we get out of the way is we delegate responsibility via tooling. We got so many requests to perform a production backup and restore into your team sandbox because you want to test with production backup, I mean production data. And so we built backup and restores into the tool. So div whenever, I mean, it initially the, the request would be made to the DevOps team to do it and we would do it like let's say one, once a month. Um, to empower them, we, we built the tool so now they can do it for themselves. So they can go port control backup full. And when it's done, the, the backup would spin up. It would backup S3, it would backup MySQL, or any other data stores. And they would just run port control restore full, specify the ID, and it would handle the entire restore. And the beauty of this is that we can kind of put in the, the relevant controls. Obviously, you can't restore production um, and stuff like that. And maybe in the future, we can kind of automate backup restores so that every Monday they kind of get fresh team sandboxes. The, the, second, the third principle is we have a view that there's shared ownership and responsibility. Um, we are all, um, everyone in the DevOps team is a developer. And <coughs> we understand and appreciate how much each developer enjoys engineering. And so we kind of, we are very proactive in regards to the educating developers in regarding to DevOps. So we really encourage questions um, and sometimes we, we, we could be accused of over explaining how things work. 
we train on tooling where we can, although we try and make the tool self-documenting. I gave the example of logs and metrics. I mean, not everyone knows how to use Kibana right off the bat or Grafana. And we view that we being viewed as wizards is proof of our failure to educate. Um, but to be honest, we haven't really done a good job at high-level write-ups. We have infrastructure as code, but we don't really have good write-ups. If you are a new developer, you'd have to spend time with us for us to explain. There is no one place that you can go and read up on how logging works. You'd have to talk to us, and then we tell you, just run your app, print to standard out, and the logs will be in the logging system. We also encourage act open participation. Since we have infrastructure as code, um, our code for infrastructure is not um, is open to everyone. It's not just the DevOps team. So our view is that we don't really own infrastructure per se. We kind of guide its vision and evolution. There has to be a team that kind of um, takes the responsibility of how um, our infrastructure will go. We view our relationship with developers as a partnership. We encourage developers to design their underlying systems. I mean, we, we are open to calls where they can ask, how does Redis work? Can we do this with Redis ETC? We do not dictate what developers do. If you want to use El Elixir, that's fine by you. If you want to use Postgres, MySQL is our default database. If you want to use a NAD database, fine, fine by us. Um, and so everyone has access to it, and they can submit pull requests. We'll review and give advice. The fourth principle is, since we are responsible for security as well, is we are, awa we, we are aware that security is an endless journey. So our, our main job is to make sure that Zappi is not on the front, front page news. Um, security is a, team, is a team effort. We have a high trust environment, which means we don't really micromanage access, although we put in the necessary, necessary controls for auditing and also flagging um, anything odd that, that if anyone does something that's insecure. We have varying deg degrees of trust. We absolutely do not trust the public. We, <laughs> we trust DevOps, anyone in the DevOps team, but that's f we always verify. Um, and we also trust our developers, but we kind of put in the controls to kind of protect them from doing anything bad. A good example is you cannot really restore production. And if you try and say, like, port control, deploy this app to production, and it's not a master branch, port control will ask you, like, are you, are you sure you want to do this? So, yeah. And we have what you call a penguin team, which is made up of volunteers from the developers who are interested in security. 37 37 developers joined the team and actively um, address security issues or even share security articles. And this is 43% of our developers, which in our view is a success. And so we know that security is not, um, it is a, it's not a destination, it's a journey. We use SSO everywhere. Um, port control has no concept of create user manually. We use a central SSO that if, if you're a new user, I mean, if you're new to the company and you join Zappi and you hit port control, it would redirect you to the SSO system, bring you back, provision you as a user, and you can create tokens so that on your CLI you can put them in, and this would generate the... Um, uh, the admission credentials into Kubernetes as well. Obviously limited with the right permissions. We pen test as often as we can. 
we automate, as I mentioned earlier, user management, um, and we also automate the revocation. So if you leave Zappi, port control will also revoke your keys and your Kubernetes access. There's no person who does this, it does it automatically. So this is continuously evolving work and we haven't really figured it out. There's a bunch of stuff that we still have to do, but right now we rely on security by obscurity. <laughs> <laughs> but it's on our backlog and we, we, are aware that we, we are aware that we want to fix them. So the, 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 the wa there's a bunch of ways that the team works that has kind of helped us get to this point. Um, we have infrastructure as code, we dog food, we use port control to deploy port control and to release port control. Um, we are very big on feedback. We try and fix any issue that's raised as quickly as possible. If it's simple, we'll do it immediately. If it's, um, if it's a bit of a mission to, to get the feature in, we'll kind of plan and strategize. This kind of ties in with proactive support because people who uh, raise issues with support give feedback. And we try to document as much as we can. We don't do, as I mentioned before, we don't do so well with high level write-ups, but all our, all our code is, 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 all our infrastructure is codified. And also for the stuff that's not, uh, cannot be covered by Terraform, we kind of archive the, the processes on Slack, yeah. So where, d where do we go from here? I mean, there's still work for us to do. So th we know that we don't do too well on the four golden signals, which is latency, traffic, errors, and saturation. Our approach to metrics right now has been very reactive. So if we are running Elasticsearch and we kind of hit like the high disk space, we'll kind of set up an alert for Elasticsearch and then we wait for the next service to kind of fall apart. So we, we and uh, it's not, it's not, it's not be because we don't want to, I mean, there's a lot of work for us to do. Um, we want to implement more white box monitoring. We've kind of prioritized the metrics that are ex external facing. Um, and we, I mean, in general, this all boils down to improving alerting. This is uh, the main thing that we want to do going forward, at least for the next one year. And so um, there are some challenges that, in addition to alerting, there are some challenges we haven't really addressed. So it's becoming a real pain point for our developers to support all these microservices locally. As a DevOps team, we haven't really figured it out. That's why I've put question marks. Um, we, we think it would be cool to kind of have different deployment strategies. We, we just use the default rollout strategies that Kubernetes gives us, but we were looking at blue-green type deployments, canary deployments. We haven't done that stuff. Um, obviously, with, micro, with microservices, you know, uh, fall into the issue of debugging calls across networks. Like, as your request bounces between microservices, how, d how do you know where it failed, how long it took, performance, and all that? Um, we, we have the ambitious goal of democratizing secrets management. Right now, how we handle secrets is we are the only ones who handle secrets. We encrypt them but we want to move this to port control where anyone can submit secrets or um, anyone can submit secrets and, and also just to automate the system so that maybe we can get dynamic secrets using Vault, you know. Um, and and how, how it can work that people can submit secrets is that you can say something like port control, create secret, it encrypts it. Um, we just, cr we, we, we don't, and in the application, the applications r reference the secret, use the secret by reference. 
um, and also on support. It, since Port Control has all the logs for all the deployments, it knows which deployment failed, which succeeded. Could we possibly kind of train a model on that data so that if a deployment fails on a migration, we can just tell the developer this is a migration uh, migration issue, fix this or stuff stuff like that. So I'm, and so I mean in summary, um, I'd say invest in your own internal workflow tools. These are initial cost, but the payoff is really good at the end. Um, always keep the main thing as the main thing. <coughs> Use empathy as your key driver. I mean, if you're empathetic towards your developers, you'll kind of know what their main, their main issues are. And something that we are proud of as a DevOps team is that is when we get messages on Slack saying, port control is so cool. And I'm not just blowing our own horn, like we get this quite a bit. And I think it's testament to us really focusing, putting ourselves in the developer's shoes. Automate and delegate as much as you can. Um, if you're a small team, you can kind of scale yourself via empowerment. Security is like a long road trip with friends that never ends. So um, take a step at a time. Um, our journey through this is about, spans about two to three years. So this is not something we, we, we really did in one week or one month or even one year. And I mean, there's, and lastly, there's no better time to rethink your infrastructure. Thanks. Um, so we've got a little bit of time for maybe one or two questions. I'm going to go ahead and ask the first question, if I may. Um, during my time at Zappi, I remember one of the big goals was the ability to auto scale, um, yeah. particularly financial reasons. You can use spot instances or that sort of thing. Um, did you achieve that goal? Yes, we did. We so we, we kind of we, we implemented scaling based on the system metrics, the typical CPU stuff, and we also scale based on custom metrics. So we have the ability to scale based on stuff that doesn't exist in Kubernetes, like HTTP requests. Um, we could even put our, our own metrics in there. Um, if there are many orders coming in, we can scale on that if we wanted. And we were able to also kind of split our workloads. We put the app servers in on-demand instances, and we put the workers on spot instances, which also reduced our costs. So it scales based on need. Yeah. That's awesome. Any questions from anybody else? Thank you. Um, so you were speaking about sandboxing an environment which is in prod. Um, in the case that, well, you also said that you can't restore prod itself, correct? Yeah. Um, in the case that you have an environment that is kind of like a pre-environment, which is a replica of prod. Yeah. Once pre goes down, um, it's difficult to restore that back to a similar version of what prod was. How would you deal with a situation like that? Because... Like obviously it would be on a smaller scale since you're sandboxing environments, but how do you deal with those situations? Because I mean it affects like many things, you know, services, um, host IPs, just basic configuration stuff. Is this re you're asking about restoring on sandbox or like the non other non prod? Um, so you could say uh, another not not prod exactly. Like, st like staging, or I'm trying to understand the question. So a sandboxed environment, which would be a replica of production in, or, right. in that situation, yeah. I, I mean, we, we, our sandbox environments are not exactly um, things we care 
too much about. If it fails, you just restore it again. Um, if, you need more, if, you, if you need fresh data, you just create another backup, restore it again. They, there's no, they, we don't, at least from the developer's point of view, they don't really care or they're not affected as much if it goes down because of data or stuff like that. So it's, it, our team sandboxes us. We can pretty much throw them away and and restore them back. Cool. I um, mean, just do you want to continue so, that? Sorry, and I mean, ju just when it when a discussion we had around team sandboxes that is quite interesting is um, we kind of thought of what if every developer gets their own team sandbox that you can say port control, team sandbox up, it brings them up, shuts them down over the weekend, um, kind of make them even more disposable than they are right now. Yeah, so. 